Hey everyone, I'm so excited for this episode of Comb Talks. We're here in New York. We're at the United Nations headquarters. Hello, it's so epic to be here. I've got an amazing panel here today and I have an even more amazing co-moderator with me. I've got Dominic Davis, who is the senior journalist for TechCrunch. I'm so stoked to have you with me. Uh, let's introduce yourself and then we can get some introductions with uh, our panelists. Yes. Oh my gosh. Thank you for having me, Amanda. Um, I mean, I'm also really excited for today. And I mean, I guess for those watching, um, if you think sustainability is just about climate change and the environment, well, you're wrong. Um, and we're going to take you on, we're, we're going to help you, I don't know, we're going to fundamentally guide you and break everything down uh, so you really get um, an understanding of what's happening. But before we start that, I will just give it to our panelists to introduce themselves. So hello, everybody. I'm Lisa Peterson, and I am the owner of Afton Engineering. I had a 30-year career in industry, and now I am doing what I am most passionate about, which is helping companies with their um, CSR, ESG, and sustainability. So all those acronyms, and we'll talk more about those acronyms in a little bit. What do those even mean? We'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> That's right. Um, guys, thank you. Uh, I've never been to the UN before. I've lived in the city forever. Um, this is the perfect and it took Canadians to get Yeah, you know, the Canadians got me in here, and I'm really excited. Thank you. Uh, the subject matter is... Uh, is really important to me, both on a business side and on a personal side. Um, I'm happy to be uh, helpful. I'm also happy to be here to learn. So this is uh, exciting. Nothing worse than trying to script something. Uh, the conversation is uh, free flowing and I love that. So I'm, I'm excited to be with you guys. Thank you. Doug, you're joining us. Hi. Um, yeah, well, thank you for inviting me. Um, I've learned new acronyms before I even started. I'm out of home. Who knew? But anyways, this, this is great. I'm really excited to be, be here. My name is Doug Reagan. I work with UN Habitats. That's a UN agency in charge of cities and urban sustainability globally. Um, I'm based out of Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I mean, we are well, you are in our headquarters um, here in New York. Um, I'm in the headquarters in Africa, which is in Nairobi. Um, and we're all about sustainability, but in all forms of the people's places, the environment, how it all links. We have 17 sustainable development goals that have all beautifully colored that are really cool. So we'll go into that uh, later on. But yeah, thanks so much for inviting me. Thank you all so much. I'm really excited to have you here. And thank you, Doug. I don't know what time it is. It looks like it's dark behind you. <laughs> so I don't know if it's really early or really late, but I'm so appreciative of you joining us. And and Lisa and Cappy and Dom, thank you so much for, for being here. I kind of want to just like start off with a super, you know, let's get into the nitty gritty, the hard basic question. So I'm going to direct this question at, at Lisa and Doug, because we want to get to the fundamentals, the root of the issue or the, the topic. What is sustainability? Because I know when I hear the word, sometimes I just think immediately about climate and you're going to help educate us on how much more expansive it is. Uh, so Lisa, maybe I'll throw to you first. Like what is sustainability? Help us. <laughs> All right, well, I like to start off with the answer to that as a three-legged stool. So sustainability, planet, people, and profit. And think of it as they have to be in balance in order for the stool to stay standing. So if you focus on the environment with no concern about being profitable and caring about your customers, your stool falls over. And similarly, the others, if you focus on, the, on profitability and don't care about society or customer's needs and the environment, again, your stool falls over. So focus on a balance of planet, people, and profit. I love that. I love that. Doug, give us a United Nations perspective and, and maybe help us understand the 17 goals. <laughs> 
<laughs> all 17. Um, well, maybe not all so, 17. I mean, we're, we're on limited okay. time here. <laughs> right. Okay. So, I mean, I, I mean, I, I really like the planet people and profit. I mean, we are obviously more on the planet people side, less on the profit side, but having said that, it depends how you define profit. The, the big thing for us is that um, the challenge of the word sustainability is really that it's kind of coined in the developed world. It's kind of coined in Europe and Asia, uh, North America. So when we look, talk about sustainability, as you say, we often lean towards environment, um, especially with the climate change crisis we're in right now, we, we define it that way. Um, but we also know that if you don't, as was just said, I mean, if you don't have everything in balance, you're kind of screwed. Um, so if you can go completely environment and then completely forget the people component, well, it doesn't work. You know, people, people have to eat, people have to survive, trade-offs have to be made. And oftentimes trade-offs have to be made in what the, the third piece you put in their profit. I mean, people have to, we use NGO-ish language like livelihoods or whatever, but basically people have to eat, they have to put a, whole, a, a roof over their head, they have to have basic water, basic sanitation, that kind of stuff. If they don't have those pieces, then the, the hell with the environment, they're going to yeah. mow it down just to survive. So you need to you need to have all those in balance. And I, I think the challenge with the sustainability, it's kind of, there's, you know, you get the buzzwords that are out there all the time, you get it often time in management. I mean, I come to New York all the time and people are talking about spaces. I'm in this space. I mean, I have no idea what that means. I mean, it's, it's great. I'm mean, happy you have that space. But you come up with these buzzwords and sustainability has been, it's an older buzzword. Um, and I think we just have to unpack it a bit. I think if you look at- I think I want to like tap into that okay. for a second. I'm sorry. Sure. Because sustainability is a bit of a buzzword right now. Like it's the hot topic. It's like, more popular than the term COVID and I'm so overhearing about COVID, but like it's a big, you know, demand from the media side and in our industry from the business side. So could you define for us the, the, the definition of CSR? So we've got these acronyms, we've got ESG, we've got CSR. So perhaps Lisa or, or Doug and, I thought you've got some background noise, so I might throw to Lisa. <laughs> so, Lisa, could you define what you know ESG and CSR represent for those who are unfamiliar with these acronyms? Before we kind of move into like how it affects the media industry specifically. Sure. So the term CSR stands for Corporate Social Responsibility. And really at the, at the crux of that, it is the duty a corporation has to be profitable, right? Return a, make a return to their shareholders, but do so in a method that is both ethical and legal with a care for the environment and being philanthropic. So those are really the four primary tiers or um, sometimes you see them as quadrants um, in a CSR circle, but it's those four elements. And in the order I gave them, there would be a baseline and then moving up to philanthropy at the top of the pyramid. Um, next term you mentioned, ESG, environmental, social, and governance. And frequently these are the metrics that companies will use to define what it is they are going to measure. And so out of this, right, step one is CSR. Step two is defining your metrics, which may be like in the ESG space. And then the sustainability plan is what comes on the back end. But in putting together a sustainability plan without having metrics defined and without understanding your commitment to, co social, to corporate social responsibility, you're sustainability plan actually has no meat on its bones. So I, I kind of, I love this definition because for us as media people and Kathy, I'm, I'm coming to you next. So give me one, one hot second, but working in the media industry for so long, CSR has been a really hot topic, but ESG has been recently introduced as a metric of, of measuring how effective we are with our CS, CSR. So, I know that, you know, at Comb, we have had so many uh, agency partners, buying partners recently reach out to us about 
our stance on sustainability. And it's been kind of a blanket statement about, you know, sustainability, I'm going to use quotations, but with no sort of definition surrounding it. So, so Cap, I kind of want to understand from your perspective, like, why are so many clients really requesting and looking for an understanding of, of sustainability? And do you think there is a true understanding of the difference between, you know, the, the CSR component versus the actual measurable side of how effective we are in delivering our CSR. So, wow. Um, let, let, <laughs> I know, me, let, me, let me unpack that one. <laughs> uh, I, let me start by saying, um, full name is Keith Kaplan. My nickname is Cappy. Um, somehow I lost the identity to Keith a long time ago, but um, I have the pleasure of being the global CEO of uh, Kinetic. Um, which is um, an uh, agency inside the Group M, which is inside of WPP, the largest ad agency network in the world. Um, you know, my quick response to you is, I want them to be asking. They should be asking. We should be asking ourselves. And there's two things that I always go back on. We are to look at the world um, in advertising as the client and the consumer. And there's your responsibility client and consumer. And I don't know about all of you, but I challenge myself every day to put the cup in the right basket in my house, to pick up that one piece of paper on the ground. I mean, how many people in your lifetime have you seen walking down the street, grabbing a piece of paper or a cup and putting it in the basket? I've seen it a hundred times. I hope you all have seen the same. I'm that person. So when it comes to what are we doing for business and our clients, sure, they're asking every day. I don't think we have a client that doesn't want to discuss it. Um, but let's look in the mirror first. You know, I have Levi's on. Why do I wear Levi's? All of you wear your designer jeans, whatever they might be. These Levi's I may have for 27 years because they're made really well with high quality. And guess what? I don't need to go buy another pair. Now, Maybe I did if I get bigger or smaller, but these are the pair that continues to fit me. If you were to go into uh, Patagonia, their return, they, they actually came out with a New York Times ad not too long ago, maybe pre-COVID, we don't want you to buy a jacket. Let's just fix the one you have. Because every time you buy a jacket, it doesn't help the earth. And so for a corporation to come out there like that and say, don't buy a product, you already have one of ours. I think those are the cool things that we can start to think about as people. Again, just being people, what can we all do a bit better? And I know that I'm proud that I work for WPP. There is a big initiative and you go to WPP.com and take, take a look at some of the, the stances and the position we've taken as an organization. We're all over it. We, I, I would bet you we're miles ahead of everyone else because it does matter. And we've thrown out dates and carbon neutral and all of those things are out there. Let me walk down the out of home piece for a moment. We are doing our best to um, eco print. We're out there trying to create paper that puts um, a cleanliness into the environment and does some cleaning on its own. We take some of the billboards that um, have been out there, these what they call posters, and they're on vinyl. And we donate them to companies that make backpacks for kids all over the world, wallets and things of that nature. So I believe we're all doing something. We're not doing enough, that's for sure. Because when you wake up and the first thing you hear is that California is 122 degrees or some crazy number like that, or that Germany has to decide whether they're gonna shut power down a bit because it's just a strain on the system. So it, it, not where you fall on whether there is an issue with our climate or that there's global warming, we have real things to think about. And so I think a lot of people, if you're in your daily work, daily effort, daily lifetime, you start to think as a person, you can do a lot more for your clients and make great recommendations. Um, we are gonna spend some time after this panel um, so I can actually became, become even more educated about what I don't understand. Um, and I know there's a lot out there. I think it's so amazing. Like the fact that we're, we're 
in the United Nations headquarter. We've got Doug from the UN Habitat. Like we're, we're all learning together. And I think we all have a lot to learn together. Dominic, I know you and I were speaking prior to this, uh, to this discussion, and you were asking me about, you know, specifically billboards associated with energy. So I know you've got a question that you want to ask the group uh, about that. So perhaps you could, you could jump in here. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, and this question's for everyone. Um, so when you think of out of home, uh, billboards are, you know, a big thing and they're asso really associated with energy consumption. And so can an industry like that be sustainable, like despite its energy consumption? I want to go first. I'm happy to take a swing at that. All right. <laughs> um, I think it's a very broad question. And I think uh, what's going on in Minneapolis or um, a, a city in Pakistan or somewhere else around the world, we don't know what that actual energy consumption is to keep it illuminated. And I think it's important to understand that because, again, these are real estate um, ventures that create signage. And signage, in some respects, um, come from the municipality in a big city. So I would I, I'd be... I'd be wrong in saying I understand how these all get powered because we don't. We don't know the answer to that. Do I think there's a better way to do it? Always. We have figured out solar, right? Look, there is a bunch of cars being driven around in Europe. The, the play for Uber is that they're trying to get to 100% EV. And the fact that I think 10% of the cars today are EV on the road over there for Uber, it's almost close to 50%. So if we do more, and but what, by the way, let's not just have an opinion. Let's get some real facts and learning. I would love to take on all of that, but it needs to be given to me, and it needs to be someone needs to stamp it and certify it and help me through it. So I love to be such an interesting perspective. I, I really appreciate that. We've had so many uh, questions and conversations coming to us at Comb, uh, particularly recently about our stance on sustainability, and so I'd love to hear from you, Doug, about you know, the UN perspective on, on billboards and, and where you think we can be more sustainable. H how can we help the environment outside of just, you know, the climate and the energy side of things? So give us your perspective. Okay. Well, I mean, like I, I think the conversation is that, that, that's, that yes, the billboard companies and, and such are looking at ecological sustainability, can you turn the lights off, so on and so on. But I think the social sustainability is really critical because it's part of the urban environment, if you want to say it that way. And what we've seen is that when um, billboard companies or companies that are doing stuff like this allow their billboards to be used for social messaging, this is a critical, this is really important for groups. And I will, let me just give you a really quick example. The winner of the digital art climate change um, uh, event that we had at COP, the big climate change conference we had, was a youth group in an informal settlement in a slum, and they did a huge mural on climate change as a way to promote climate change, and they won the award. Because, and they, we also, over the COVID, the two-year COVID period, were using murals all over the world as a way of promoting COVID awareness, and especially in illiterate communities or communities that have very low literacy, because it's a great way to message. It's beautiful. People get jobs doing it. Um, and, and it reaches a huge audience. So I, I would strongly suggest, yes, keep the ecological side, but also look at the social sustainability side because it's really critical. I love that. Uh, Kathy or, or Lisa, do you have any comments you want to add? Yeah, I, if it's okay, I'd like to jump in on that. I think one of the things that we often talk about is, uh, let's take a city like New York for a moment. You know, how much does the bus cost to get on? And is there a value for some of the transportation signage that goes there inside the subway system? system? Would the would a fare cost nine dollars if there was no advertising? Again, I don't know the contracts of some of the providers that work and do the the good deed. I think controlling the right advertising, and we are very restricted in some cities. There is no alcohol in some cities. There is no this and that. So I like the controls of it, but I also like the money goes back to the municipality for transportation. L you know, we, we want to be in a world that we don't force people to spend so much money on a public way of transportation. And I say, I think some of the things that have been done with that are, are excellent. 
So I think we need to do a better job with that all over um, the states and EMEA and the rest of the world. Um, but I think there is some really social good there that I think needs to be pointed to once in a while. So thank you for bringing that up. I think it's a good point. Yeah, I think so too. And I know that there's a lot of, um, on the CSR vein, there's, there are a lot of out of home companies that, that partner with like the homeless, um, not for profits and, and endeavors, but Lisa, y- you had something that you wanted to, to share with us, I think. Yeah. So as I bring the question back home, it was originally, uh, sustainability and is it a stamp or a yes or no? And the answer is no, it's not. It's a journey. And it's on a continuum. And so you do things that contribute to sustainability. And every year you try to do better and better. So if you're looking for the check mark or the the stamp that says I'm sustainable, sorry, you're not getting that. (laughs) Dom, you and I were chatting just before this about, you know, how how companies can tie this bag. So I think I'm going to throw it to you because I know you've got a question for for our esteemed panelists about about that topic. Yeah, I mean, I mean, how should a company tie uh, the program back to like the core business objectives? So we normally start with corporate social responsibility, and we ask. Let me back up even one step further. I typically ask why. So if a client comes to me and says, um, "I'm interested in sustainability." I will ask them why. Is it because your board of directors is demanding it? Is it because your customers are demanding it? Or is it because it's an internal push? You view it as a strategic initiative. You want to be ahead of the pack and do this before any of your competitors are doing this. Um, Then CSR is where we will start with the discussion because this is the foundation. It's understanding What is important to you and what is important to your stakeholders? We move into metrics and only after that do we develop the sustainability plan. That makes a lot of sense. I I like that from a, you know, a strategic perspective. You're kind of looking at it from a phased approach. I think that's great. Um, I'm I'm also going to... Oh, come on. Jump in. (laughs) Well, you... You asked at the beginning about uh, measurements and such, and then we have the 17 sustainable development goals. Now, I know how could only a bureaucracy could come up with 17 sustainable development goals, but nonetheless, they're there. And they cover the whole range, everything from poverty to climate change. They have indicators, targets, and uh, many industries. And I um, I mean, we, we can leave, I can send you more information on this. I don't have it off the top of my head. But a lot of industries and a lot of the private sector are using the sustainable development goals which have basically been adopted by the 193 countries of the world in the lovely building you're in um, as a way to, ju- to see their metrics. How are, they, how are they achieving this? Oftentimes, some of them adopt a sustainable development goal like the climate change goal or the pop so on. So there, are, there is an attempt, and this uh, the last piece coming back to the governance side, which you mentioned ESG, which I'd never heard of before, but I think the governance side is critical um, because I think it, we need to have the ability to say, how are we doing? Are we doing well? Are we doing bad? How can we do better? And that's so there is measurement tools out there. I would strongly encourage people to use them. I love that. So I guess to follow up to uh, that question and talking about business, um, do you think every company needs like a chief sustainability officer? Um, and I guess In addition to that, um, how involved should a CEO or senior leadership be in um, CSR initiatives and decisions? I guess that's to me. Um, I'll I'll take a little bit of that. Um, The answer is I think everyone has to be involved. I don't think this is not a leadership thing. I think this has to be the core principles of the people who work in your organization. I'm not sure that hiring people that don't believe in it um, is really good for the overall end of the business. You have to try to improve the work environment, one, two, the, the environment outside of our work and the things that we give back to, to sort of the universe and to the earth. So your first part of that was, should there be an officer that works on that? There should be more than an officer. There should be a team up against that. And those teams should not work in a silo. That's for sure. Not just internally. They should get together with all the agencies that are out there or all the people that are in automotive or, or anyone who's out in services and entertainment. There needs to be bodies working together. There is, to your great point, 
this is a journey. There's not one company or one brain that's going to fix this. We have to just keep moving towards it and grading ourselves on, on progress. No progress is bad. Little pro progress is good. Lots of progress is amazing, but we just can't take a break. I think there's no time for us to break. This generation owns that and we need to leave a better place than we may have received. And it just has to transcend to the next, to the next, to the next. So I think it's our job as organizations and leaders and people to fix and do what we can, not just a little, just do as much as we can. So I'll add- I, I honestly like love that statement. And, and Lisa, I apologize, I, I will throw to you in a second. I think that we, we speak so much about the next generation, Gen Z is having you know, $390 billion of disposable income and being you know, this power consumer that buyers and, and brands and advertisers are trying to be able to connect with but it can't be superficial. It has to be on a real level. And I think that in order to do that on a real level, it takes a cultural change. Like it takes a true cultural change from a corporation perspective in all areas of brand, buyers, agencies, media owners, like my, my corporation as a, an association. We all need to look at things a bit differently because it is a very different consumer that has a very different value system. Um, and Lisa, please, you know, I know you've got like your top three takeaways and, and you've got some, some top three insights that you want to share with us. I know we're nearing the end of our time here, so uh, I'd love to hear from you. So the answer on, uh, for, to that previous question is everybody needs to be involved in the company. Um, the CEO can't just give it lip service and not be committed. And meanwhile, the entire organization has to be involved. And this is where we find these initiatives to actually uh, be very successful, is when everybody in the organization plays a role. As far as a chief sustainability officer, the large corporations have that because there are entire departments that are working on sustainability for some of these large multinational corporations. Not everybody is a large multinational corporation and that's okay. You don't need to have someone defined in that role. There's usually someone who is championing and keeping it moving forward. But again, everybody needs to be involved. Well, I, I laugh at I think I'm the chief sustainability officer in my home. Mm -hmm. Right? I've converted, I've converted everyone. There is not a plastic water bottle ever in my home. Uh, we're doing cans at this point, right? With seltzer. Um, but I'll move on to that soda machine someday, whatever that machine is. I'll get everyone converted. But I'm that role. So I, I, I love your point. It does. You should be of your little world, whatever that world is, big, corporate, or even in your household. So I think we're all officers for that change and cause. I love it. And uh, before we wrap up, I think it would be a good idea to ask all the panelists, what is a key takeaway from this discussion today? What have you learned? What do you want to learn more about? What are you going to implement in your own lives and businesses? Um, I guess, Kathy, would you like to go first? Uh, simple. Um, I don't know enough, and I need to do more. And for me, I, I learned some things that are happening in this industry that I was not aware of, um, and I'm very impressed with some of the initiatives that have been undertaken already. So congratulations. Um, I think <clears throat> I think it's oftentimes we fall into our silos. You're the private sector. We're the UN. You're this, and I think the what the conversations we have here really show that we can work together in those different ways. And you guys, sometimes we may not think, oh, you know, the private sector is really not struggling. This is all just a communications thing. I think you guys are struggling with it too. I think you're being pushed by your your consumers, you're being pushed by your employees to, to do stuff. And so I think the more we have these conversations, the more we can explore how we can really bring about sustainability, especially in these incredibly challenging times of climate change and so on, which we know we have to do that. So that's my takeaway. I love that. Such a, such a great conversation today. I just want to thank you all uh, for taking the time out and joining us here. I can't believe we're in the UN headquarters. Like, what the heck? It's so cool. Um, I apologize if there was some background noise because um, there was some alarms going off. And I mean, it is the UN. There's some tense security here. But 
but um, Lisa, you can summarize for us in, in three easy steps, right? I, I, we've right. talked about this before. So like hit us with those three steps. What can we do? All right, what do we so, need to do? So clients, uh, I usually help guide them through three fundamental steps. Step one, benchmark. Understand what are your customers doing? What are your suppliers doing? What are your competitors doing? And this will give you a good feel for either where you can be better than them or at least be headed in the same direction. And you'll glean some very insightful information from doing that benchmarking. And then step two is developing the metrics that are important to you and to your stakeholders. And the United Nations SDGs, those Sustainable Development Goals, are outstanding metrics to use. Um, there are others in the ESG space, but certainly many of my clients will use three to five or five to seven of the SDGs in, as their metrics for their plan. And then finally, you want to develop your sustainability plan and report on it and tell your story. It's your story. Be proud of it. And don't hesitate, but make sure you have the data to support whatever you are putting out for information. I love this. And I also think like just coming from that, you know, auditing perspective or, or evaluation perspective, like this is an ongoing process. It's not a one and done. Like we need to be responsible continuously. So we need to ensure that we've got programs and certification components that actually you know, validate what we are doing from that metric perspective, from that ESG perspective. And I'm so excited about it. ESG is a term that I've learned today. So um, Dom, on your question of what, what did you learn today? Today, I learned about ESG. Um, very familiar with CSR, but uh, I, I, ESG is something that's uh, new to me. So thank you, Lisa, for, for sharing that knowledge. I want to thank all three of my esteemed panelists and Dom, uh, my my co-moderator for your time. I know it's, uh, it's been an incredible conversation. So I'm, I'm very excited to continue this conversation. And uh, if you have follow up questions and and want to get in touch, we'll link some some contact information below. But uh, thank you to everyone. Lisa, Kathy, Doug, Dom, much appreciated. Dom, do you want to share any closing remarks or does anyone want to share any closing remarks? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. If you want to learn more about our esteemed panelists organization, we're going to give a little shout out here. So off to you. We'll go with that. We'll, we'll go with Doug first. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, yeah, it's UN Habitat, U-N-H-A-B-I-T-A-T dot org. Um, and that's where you can go. I've also dropped some links to you guys that you can follow that talk about private sector and sustainable development goals. And then a really cool video on young people doing an amazing outdoor mural that I think would be really interesting. So, yeah. Thanks so much. Love it. Cappy, you're up next. Uh, you guys can always reach me at cappy at kineticww.com, K-A-P-P-Y. I do respond. You're also welcome to hit me on LinkedIn. I love a note. Just don't try to connect with me. Write me a note and we'll spend some time. I get everyone an audience, right? So it's important for, for the world to continue to contribute with each other. And so if I can be of help to you guys, I'm happy to do so. Just let me know, reach out. I'm, uh, I'm there again at kinetic, uh, uh, com or cappy at kineticww.com. And Lisa Peterson. So my email, L Peterson, L P E T E R S O N at afton.com. That's A F T A N.com or website, www.aftonsustainability.com. Thanks. Last but definitely not least, my esteemed co-moderator, Dom from TechCrunch. Yeah, I mean, I guess you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram. <laughs> um, I have the same handle for both. Um, Dominic Midori, D-O-M-I-N-I-C-M-A-D-O-R-I. Hit me up. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm so excited for this Comb Talk. It's such a special edition for us to be at the UN. I'm so stoked, like such a powerful topic about sustainability. And I know I learned a lot. 
if you want to learn more and if you want to stay in touch with with comb and all of our uh, upcoming home talks visit us at comb.ca slash talk and keep in touch <laughs>